Hi, everyone. We'll just give it a few more seconds. All right, well, welcome everyone to the Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. We've been thinking about democracy and development, not only in other parts of the world, but also in the United States, if you've been following our seminars. We have a nascent project on building racially inclusive democracies in places where democracy is longstanding. And today we'll be taking a closer look at race and capitalism in particular. I am so honored and delighted to have Marsha Shatlin with us She's professor of history and African-American studies at Georgetown University and the author of Southside Girls um, and Franchise, The Golden Artists in Black America, which she will be discussing today. She was a Carnegie Fellow last year and was a New America Fellow a few years back. She has won a lot of acclaim for this book and we look forward to hearing from her today. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you so much, Didi. It is a real pleasure to join um, all of you today, and um, I've just been so grateful for um, Didi's um, presence as a scholar as well as a friend. And so I hope that we can have a great conversation about what we talk about when we talk about democracy. So today I'm going to talk to you about my um, book, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, which is now available in paperback. And this is a way of thinking about how we respond to um, calls for racial justice and um, the culture of civil unrest in the United States. And so I wanna start with a message from McDonald's that some of you may have noticed after the George Floyd summer ignited in 2020. This will load briefly. So by the perspective of 2020, um, it may not have seemed that unusual or distinct that McDonald's joined the chorus of many companies that um, suggested that they stand in solidarity with Black lives. And this move by McDonald's to um, declare themselves as a force against racism in the United States um, garnered some questions about whether McDonald's was being too political or whether or not um, it was appropriate for the company to do so. But from the vantage point of someone who's been studying McDonald's uh, for nearly a decade, McDonald's declaration that Black Lives Matter is consistent with a set of practices that started um, decades earlier in terms of its engagement with African Americans and the ways in which um, civil unrest has so much informed how McDonald's operates in African-American communities is the subject of my book, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. And so while I was keeping tabs on how corporations were responding to the uprisings that um, were ignited in 2020, I thought about images like this one. I'll return to my slides. This is the McDonald's in Ferguson, Missouri on Florissant Avenue. And in the summer of 2014, after the killing of Michael Brown from officer Darren Wilson. This McDonald's became a meeting place of the various actors in the drama that uh, comprised the Ferguson, Missouri uprising. And so 
police officers and National Guards people would use this as a site of shift changes. Reporters would use the free Wi-Fi in this McDonald's in order to stay in contact with editors and to file stories. And protesters often use this McDonald's for the restrooms and for food. And one night during the unrest in Ferguson, a group of protesters actually um, uh, kind of approached the McDonald's in panic because they had been tear gassed by the police. And so in some of the reflections about what happened in Ferguson, people noted that the McDonald's was actually a presence of relief, a presence of good during this period of chaos. And so for many people um, who are unfamiliar with the history of McDonald's in Black America, this may have seemed like a first, just like the tweet about Black Lives Matter may have seemed like a first. But in fact, when I saw images of the Ferguson McDonald's, it made me think of moments like this. This is Washington, D.C after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in April of 1968. And as cities across the country exploded in grief and frustration over decades worth of urban neglect that led to crises in housing and in jobs and were speaking out against the culture of police brutality and economic exploitation in the centers of um, African-American life and culture, McDonald's saw an opportunity. And this was the moment that facilitated the entrance of McDonald's into predominantly black communities in two ways. One, the introduction of African-American franchisees of McDonald's locations. And second, a concerted and targeted marketing effort to sell to the black consumer. So what does this have to do with our ideas about democracy? Well, one of the things that I found in my research on African-Americans and McDonald's was that the way that McDonald's had grafted itself onto a narrative of civil rights and economic opportunity encapsulated some of the tensions that emerged in the civil rights struggle after the death of King and reflected a sense that there were various directions that the fight for civil rights could go in. And that perhaps after 1968, the appropriate move for people who were interested in African-American freedom was to think about the marketplace and to um, think about economic empowerment as the most rational and perhaps the most mature expression of civil rights. Um, before we go any further in the story, I'd like to give you a brief tutorial on franchising. Uh, some of you may own franchises in the audience or have been approached to invest in one. So there are about 760,000 franchise businesses in the United States. And while we often associate franchising with fast food, a number of types of business um, in the US are franchises. So if you've ever been to a Hampton Inn, which is part of Hilton Hotels Worldwide, that may have been a franchise. If you've ever had to um, get an oil change at a Jiffy Lube, that is a franchise. If you've ever, um, gone to Century 21 or Remax to find a real estate agent, you were patronizing a franchise. About a quarter of a million um, of restaurants in the United States are fast food restaurants, and the majority of fast food restaurants use the franchise model for business. And the way I describe uh, franchising in the book is that it's like a family relationship in which the parents make all the rules, but the children earn all the money. Franchising um, can be a very risky business. Franchise businesses assume the liabilities of doing business while having to conform to the rules and expectations of the parent company. And this will be an issue for African-Americans as they enter the franchising world because of the disparate ways that African-Americans are expected to conduct business in hyper-segregated communities. And we'll return to that shortly. So I'm going to walk you through the chapters of the book um, in order for us to have a discussion about the various elements of McDonald's. Chapter one is called Fast Food Civil Rights, and it reimagines the history of the founding and growth of McDonald's from the perspective of African-American history, particularly the exclusions that facilitated the success of this industry. Often when business textbooks or other pieces 
talk about the founding of McDonald's, they use they usually um, tend to focus on the various innovations, the Fordism that was used to create assembly line hamburgers and the way that um, the McDonald's brothers really perfected that form. Or they talk about Ray Kroc and his leadership of McDonald's um, after 1955, when he moved the business from Southern California to the Midwest in the Chicago suburbs and created the franchise system that we have today. You may have seen the film, The Founder, where Ray Kroc is uh, portrayed by Michael Keaton as an evil genius. And while these characterizations are helpful for us to understand why McDonald's was such a powerful force um, economically and culturally, it often excludes the ways that African-American history shaped the fast food industry in the ways that the highway system facilitated more travelers to stop at places like McDonald's. And that system was predicated on the disruption of poor communities of color. We also know that a number of veterans were able to use provisions from the GI Bill to enter fast food franchising in the 1950s and 60s. And those same loans were not made available to African-Americans who are interested in this business sector. We also know that McDonald's saw itself initially as growing up in the suburbs, the very suburbs that segregated African-Americans from living in bedroom communities. And so in thinking about the way that race shaped this industry, it helps in the analysis of the ways that McDonald's was a target of desegregation activism in the 1960s. When we think about the sit-in movement and other protest struggles about public accommodations, we often think of Woolworth's drugs or Katz's drugs, brands that are not with us today. But in fact, McDonald's was part of that. And what I found uh, particularly interesting in the archive was the way that McDonald's in cities like Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Memphis, Tennessee, Durham, North Carolina, were also um, part of struggles for desegregation. And so it led me to think, what did McDonald's do to write itself out of the narrative of the mid-century struggle for desegregation? And I think its engagement with African-American communities um, conveniently moved it out of that frame. And so it was both um, representative of 1950s uh, nostalgia and Americana, and then kind of skipped over the 1960s into the 1970s where it becomes a fixture in African-American communities. So chapter two looks at um, the growth of McDonald's in African-American communities with the first cohort of black franchise owners. And these men were recruited um, among people, among local people who were interested in business and part of the ways that they entered franchising was that they were offered McDonald's locations that white franchise owners no longer wanted because they felt that they were in a racially hostile area because either the area had become predominantly black or they were concerned about the types of uprisings that emerged in 68, that it would happen again and they would be targets. And so in many ways, the franchising system mirrors some of the racial exclusions and politics of the housing market. And so you see a kind of white flight. And in the book, I talk about it as economic white flight, that when we often think about the moving of capital out of cities into suburbs, we think of it as tied to the residential market, which it was. But there was also another consequence to flight was that white owned businesses leaving African-American communities in massive numbers throughout the 19, late 50s into the 1960s, which not only limited um, kind of marketplace options for African-Americans, but it also reminded people of the ways in which African-Americans did not see themselves reflected in the economic engines of communities. So it was either a white owned business or no business at all. And so McDonald's is engaging in this recruitment process at the very same time that Richard Nixon's black capitalism initiatives are starting to gain uh, support and currency across a wide ideological spectrum. Liberals supported the idea of promoting black owned business because they were listening to the calls for black economic self-determination that characterized the work of organizations like the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, um, Operation Breadbasket, which um, Jesse Jackson would lead and then find, um, and then establish rather 
uh, Operation uh, Push, People United, United to Save Humanity. And it also reflected the support for Black capitalism that came out of organizations like King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the NAACP, um, as well as the Urban League. And so what starts to happen is this deep sense that a Black franchise McDonald's was a symbol of the potential for African-American economic autonomy during the late 1960s. And so uh, plaques like this one that commemorates the first McDonald's African-American owner operator is outside of a location on Chicago's South Side, an area that was very much the target of a lot of the frustration during the King uprisings. And it is no coincidence that this store is reopened as black owned um, eight months after King's assassination. The African-American press also spent a lot of time covering the successes of this early group of black franchise owners. At the center in this photograph is Herman Petty, who was the first black franchise owner. And he's flanked by Leonard Bennett and Willie Wilson, who also were um, employees of McDonald's in the management system. So I think about the links between um, Black economic empowerment um, schemes of the 1960s that were supported by the federal government through the Nixon administration, as well as private foundations like the Ford Foundation, and the ways that McDonald's really organized themselves in order to capitalize on these um, opportunities, whether it was grants and subsidies, um, some training, and McDonald's influence was helpful in helping future Black franchise owners into the 1970s access the bank loans and the capital necessary to invest in franchise locations. And shortly after this process started, McDonald's realized that African American consumers um, were more likely to visit McDonald's multiple times a day and that they were becoming a loyal um, consumer base. And the fact that they could see their local McDonald's as black owned was considered a benefit in terms of interacting with the brand. So chapter three, the burger boycott in the ballot box is about um, Mayor Carl Stokes bid for reelection in um, 1967 in Cleveland. Uh, mayor uh, Carl Stokes is considered the first black mayor of a major city. And his reelection bid was complicated by the fact that African-American organizations in Cleveland had created an umbrella organization called Operation Black Unity. And their goal was to ensure that the McDonald's restaurants in Cleveland, on the east side of Cleveland, which was predominantly African-American, were actually franchised by African-Americans. And so while in previous um, periods, boycotts against McDonald's were about the right of public accommodation to service, in this particular incident, instance, it wasn't about service, it was about ownership and the ways that um, communities believed that black people should be profiting from other black people. This moment creates um, a great deal of dramatics in the city. Um, there is an unsolved homicide that some people believe was associated with an African-American man's attempt to franchise a McDonald's. There is a charismatic leader who, leader, um, who later flees to uh, Guyana uh, to um, reestablish himself. Uh, around the time that Jim Jones and the People's Temple is also emerging. And there's also this kind of question about what does economic progress look like? And as I analyze the various groups that formed Operation Black Unity, each has a different idea of how McDonald's should exist within African-American communities and what the end goal should be. And so groups like CORE are saying that the goal really is better quality jobs, other than the ones that are created at McDonald's. And another group is, um, their goal is to say that McDonald's has to create a community trust where local resources will be paid for by McDonald's in exchange for customer loyalty. And other groups say, no, no, we don't need handouts from a corporation. We just need an opportunity to own a franchise. And I think that these different layers really help us understand that black capitalism was both um, a kind of nebulous term but there was a sense that people knew that um, when Black economic success happened, that this was something that people could point to and feel um, encouraged by. Uh, 
And so groups like this, this is a local group called Afroset, would um, you know stage all sorts of demonstrations outside of McDonald's locations. And they were very effective actually in starving local dollars from McDonald's and then facilitating the appointment of the first black franchise owners in Cleveland. I continue along the vein of micro histories in chapter four, bending the golden arches to look at community conflicts with McDonald's based on this idea of black autonomy. And one of um, the most fascinating stories I think in the book is of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and an allegation that the party members bombed a McDonald's because they refused to participate in their signature breakfast for children program. And so in looking at the conflict between a black radical group and McDonald's, it really brought to bear um, the different ways that groups negotiated this emerging presence in their community. I think for many of us, depending on how old we are, um, it's hard to imagine a world without McDonald's. But in the early 1970s, McDonald's was not the global brand it is today. And new interactions um, in communities um, were an issue that McDonald's is working out in a number of ways. And so after I look at the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, this is the leader, Ket Ford, with some children uh, during a breakfast, um, I look at other responses to McDonald's in the 1970s, including the Ogunst Neighborhood Association in Philadelphia that argued against McDonald's, not from a position of anti-fast food, but a sense that Black and working class communities should decide the resources and should decide the presence of business in their own communities. And to ignore the desire of community was to ignore the realities of what communities actually needed. And so I think that this um, conflict really encapsulates one of the issues I was concerned about when I wrote this book is the ways that when African-American communities are crying out for very concrete um, issues related to their representation within the democracy, the end of police brutality, decent housing, um, quality schools for their children, quality jobs, they're often met with the possibility of Black business as filling those gaps. And we know that it can't do that. So in the same ways that the George Floyd summer of 2020 elicited a lot of calls for buying Black, um, employing um, Black executives, um, supporting Black creatives or creators, um, there was never, um, there's a sense that this can substitute for the reasons, right, why people um, emerge in protest movements. And it's often the issues that I, um, I spoke about earlier, right, police brutality, um, quality housing, quality schools, good jobs. Um, Another way that communities um, or another strategy in kind of fighting back against the influence of McDonald's and African-American communities where African-American celebrities um, lent their names to businesses that marketed themselves as authentically black. So while people were sometimes confused as to whether supporting a black owned franchise was actually buying black, celebrities like, uh, like Muhammad Ali and gospel singer Mahalia Jackson said, actually, if you franchise one of our businesses, you are really keeping money within the community. And you know, the irony of both of these businesses is that they actually weren't owned by the celebrities um, who lent their names to them. But it was this idea that um, the market for franchising wasn't just about an individual opening a business, it was seen as a community reinvestment tool. So if you're going to use franchising for that purpose, you should probably go with a authentically black owned business. The latter half of the book um, really focuses on the cultural and social implications of McDonald's in the eighties um, to the present. Um, one of the things I wanted to acknowledge was the incredible generation of um, popular culture and ephemera that came out of McDonald's engagement with black communities. One of the first acts on the part of the um, group that became the National Black McDonald's Operators Association was to advocate for African-American um, market research firms as well as advertising firms to create specific advertisement for the black community. And so here we see two examples um, from the uh, 1970s 
that were attempts to speak the language and to really address the marketplace desires of Black communities. Um, one of the arguments I make in the book is that McDonald's was one of the early corporate sponsors of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Um, again, if you're of a certain age, you may remember the controversy about the passage of the federal holiday and the implementation on the state level. And McDonald's, I think, out of recognition of their position in African-American communities, as well as the way that, again, they grafted themselves onto a narrative of post-68 um, civil rights sensibilities by saying that it was after King's death they became reflective about race and invited African-Americans to become franchise owners that they really, really pushed for the King holiday before it became um, a ubiquitous part of American culture. In addition to the advertisement and the sponsorship of the King holiday, activities like gospel tours, uh, sponsorship of the All-American Double Dutch League, and the creation of the All-American basketball game were other inroads into African-American uh, cultural life. Um, in thinking about the saturation of fast food in African-American communities, it's really important to acknowledge that this process was also facilitated by major civil rights organizations. Uh, people like Jesse Jackson, who's pictured here, and if you look behind Jesse Jackson's elbow in the second row, that's Al Sharpton um, in the 1980s. It looks very different now. Um, and the National Action Network, which was anchored by Sharpton, um, played a big role in high level negotiations um, with corporations that had found themselves in the crosshairs of racial conflict, um, either accusations like the ones that were made by a black franchise owner of redlining, again, uh, real estate lingo being used to talk about franchising, that they were um, kept out of certain communities and hyper-concentrated in Black communities, as well as um, concern over representation in the corporate ranks, brought in organizations like the NAACP um, in conjunction with the Black McDonald's Operators Association to negotiate for more store locations, as well as the contracting of black banks and accounting firms, uh, advertising firms, as well as insurance agencies as responses to racial injustice. And so again, we see this approach um, was used in 2020 about um, kind of corporate critiques of what was being done for the black community. And one of the things that you know, I talk about in this chapter is that the influence of the civil rights organizations, as well as the Congressional Black Caucus in facilitating um, the growth of franchising, I think really cut out um, the critical mass of black workers within the fast food system. And that's the day-to-day -day crew members and the employees, that they were never represented in the strategy of racial reconciliation between communities and corporations. And finally, the last chapter, um, ends with a, a moment that I call the miracle of the golden arches. And this is after the Rodney King uprising in 1992. Ed Renzi, the CEO of McDonald's issued a statement after things had calmed down in Los Angeles. And he said that although Los Angeles was consumed um, in chaos during that week after the Rodney King verdict was announced that no McDonald's restaurant was harmed in the unrest and that this is a reflection of McDonald's socially progressive actions a quarter century earlier. And in tying um, McDonald's in the 1992 moment to McDonald's in 1968, um, I think that the corporation was really kind of um, establishing itself as such a positive presence, as such an ally or comrade to African-Americans that the proof was in the pudding. Um, this claim is very hard to verify, and we can talk about um, the lengths I went to actually see if this was true. But what I discovered was it didn't have to be true, that McDonald's had ingratiated itself so deeply in thinking of um, how its restaurants were in service of Black America, that the claim was believable and has been repeated um, quite often in business case studies about corporate social responsibility, as well as various articles about McDonald's and black communities. And so um, as we enter the discussion 
about some of the ideas I presented. I think that um, what I hope this research is able to do is to move beyond the kind of two frequencies in which we talk about race and fast food. The first one in thinking about health and nutrition, and we know that former First Lady Michelle Obama was really pivotal in opening a conversation about um, child health and nutrition, obesity. And these are the ways that we often think about the issue of race and fast food. Or um, to kind of add a little bit of a layer um, to the current conversations about why fast food work um, pays starvation wages and the various ways that um, these gestures, including tweets about how McDonald's believes that Black Lives Matter, never gets at um, the heart of the struggles of the most vulnerable in our world. And so um, this was um, my attempt, franchise was my attempt um, to ask and answer questions about how McDonald's, though it is a global brand that is enjoyed by many people, how it became black in the late 1960s and to really um, offer a cautionary tale from a historian's perspective about the danger of believing that marketplaces can solve um, the issues that plague um, the public sphere. And to remind us that we have common resources and we have a common good in which we can really deliver racial justice. And with that, I'll stop sharing my uh, slides and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Marsha, for that fascinating and detailed look at your book. You somehow managed to cover a lot of a lot of things while also providing some of the micro histories that make the book so effective. Um, so I am going to try to allow an audience member to speak. CDDRL's Eric Jensen, who's a law professor who has a question. I'm going to see if he would like to ask it. Eric, can you hear us? Or do you want to unmute? Ah. Yes. Marcia, this is a wonderful uh, presentation, and I I don't have a, a, a question. I've got to read the book. That, that's a, that's <laughs> an issue, but I, I don't have a, a question other than to ask you if you're uh, going to further your research agenda on Black economic empowerment. You know, um, COVID has made research so challenging that sometimes I forget um, what it was like to be in archives for several years for this book. Um, there are two issues that I would like to take up um, in future projects, and one may be a journal article, and then the, the other one might be a full book. Um, the first one is, um, I had the opportunity to visit Stanford University Libraries um, maybe three or four years ago, and what I discovered was that there was a similar initiative that um, brought the National Council of La Raza and McDonald's together to try to recruit more Latinx um, McDonald's franchise owners, as well as a partnership in which um, McDonald's helped underwrite some various um, cultural products that was targeting um, the Spanish speaking audience, including tray liners with vocabulary words and um, a series of short films on you know, heroes um, of, of Latin America and Mexico. And so, I think that that particular work is interesting because um, the assumptions that are made about Latinx communities and consumers are very different than the assumptions that are made about African Americans. And I wanna think about how this becomes part of a different type of targeting. And then the second project um, that I'm really fascinated to buy, and you know, I, I could have written 20 books um, and I had to just kind of finally settle in one place, but one, issue that I'm particularly interested in is the cohort of African-American um, market uh, researchers and advertising um, executives who worked on these campaigns. There's been a lot about their importance to kind of marketing um, what we call multi -multi multicultural or segmented marketing, but a number of them worked for the tobacco and the alcohol industry. And they found themselves at odds with some of the campaigns by members of the Congressional Black Caucus to remove billboards that um, targeted Black communities with cigarettes and alcohol. And I kind of want to think about maybe a group biography of the formation of this group of people and the ways that their careers kind of were upended by new um, kind of analysis of the dangers of market-based inclusion. 
Thank you so much. And I should remind the audience that if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, I will try to experiment with letting some people talk, but I'll also be posing questions to Marsha as we get them. Um, so we have one now about um, from an anonymous attendee question. How do you feel about the prevalence of black owned business lists that are popping up in food media? What's the balance between supporting those entrepreneurs and um, also what, what they term the sheer absurdity of these lists as a temporary <laughs> solution to an enduring problem? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy that there is um, a kind of level of consciousness about how one's dollars are spent, but this is not a strategy for any kind of racial or economic justice because I think, and I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, but I think I have them right. Um, there are about maybe, I think 1.5 million black owned businesses in the United States. And I wanna say more than 90% of them are kind of sole proprietor, one person, one shingle kind of operations. That supporting black business is not a job strategy at all because most black businesses do not have the capacity for um, creating jobs nor for creating like the solid jobs that we need. And so I think what happens is a sleight of hand that has been the strategy since the early 20th century, where there's these moments of great racial unrest and violence, and people are very clear as to what the problems are, right? You can look at the Chicago um, Race Riot Commission of 1919. You can read the Kerner Commission report. You can read the reports um, after Ferguson. People need jobs. They need good housing. They need quality schools for their um, children, and they need the police not to brutalize them. And it's like um, the, the teacher in Peanuts, it's like no one can hear anything. And they say, you know what, businesses, we need businesses. And you know, sometimes it's done in bad faith, like it was supported by Richard Nixon. And I think sometimes it's done with a lot of good intention, but supporting black business also reifies this idea that black business have to carry the weight of state failure. And it's, and it's it just can't be this way. Um, I have a question about representation in the national business interest community. How have franchises and especially restaurants, McDonald's, it's part of a growing sort of service sector in our neoliberal economy anyway, have they been able to find representation in traditional vehicles for business like the National Association for Manufacturers or Chambers of Commerce? Oh, that's so have they interesting. Been able to be advocates of business interests writ large and also to advocate for racial equity issues within, within the business community alone? Oh, that's really a great question. So um, a lot of what the franchise industry was able to pull off in the late 60s and continue into the 80s and 90s um, for a very long time, and I don't think it is anymore, but a McDonald's franchise is con was considered a small business for the purposes of lending um, for the Small Business Administration, as well as for the Office of Economic Opportunity, which was doing a lot of these minority set-asides and opportunities. And so that kind of designation allowed it to kind of be in the same category of the regular um, you know, coffee shop around the corner. And one of the issues of consternation in the late 60s was after this huge pronouncement about black capitalism on the part of the Nixon administration, people were saying, we tried to access these programs. We're not getting any capital and we're not getting into programs that are for small business, but the franchises are able to. And so I think there's that. Um, you know, the fast food industry, I think, is so important um, for how the restaurant industry is able to operate. Because even though we make the distinct distinctions as consumers, a lot of um, what the fast food industry is able to do is not only influence uh, wages, but issues of production, um, as well as um, issues of health, safety, and supply. So, so they are everywhere. But the idea that your franchise is a small business is one of the ways that um, franchising has tried to obscure scrutiny. Okay, interesting. Um, so we have a question from Alberto diaz Cairos, uh, who's asking, who's one of ours. I'm going to try to unmute him. Sorry for all of this like tech. You know, no worries, this is, this is always a lot of work. Alberto, are you by any chance available? 
I don't know if you can hear me, but yeah, I can hear you. Ah, Excellent. So this is great technology. I love it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was wondering, you know, Marsha, uh, this is so interesting. Um, but, you know, from a perspective as a, as a Latin American, um, you know, McDonald's has always been seen outside the U.S. as the symbol of U.S. imperialism. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about 60s, 70s. So I was wondering whether some of this reputation filtered down into the Black communities, you know, of, of, of you know, kind of almost like this ambivalence, you know, uh, of pride towards the institution, but at the same time, it's a symbol of, of US uh, encroachment in the rest of the world. <laughs> you know, I think this is such a great question because, um, you know, McDonald's, we all know what a McDonald's is, but it just means so many different things. And when I was um, in the research process for this book, I would give a talk and, um, you know, someone would come up to me, a white person would come up to me and say, like, this is so novel. How would I know who my McDonald's franchisee is? Like, why would I know who this person is? And African-Americans would say, yeah, I knew the guy who was the local franchise owner because he was everywhere, right? He was on black radio stations telling people to register to vote. He was in local fundraisers, you know, with the novelty checks, donating to local historically black colleges and universities. People would use the scholarships um, from being employees there to go to school, right? So it's about these relationships of proximity and the long history of Black business owners being the unelected officials and diplomats of Black America in order to facilitate the relationships that African Americans needed because they were outside of so many public resources. It's interesting because McDonald's was a target of that kind of criticism um, in the 1970s. And even people who were anti-McDonald's were not necessarily anti-Black economic opportunity. And so there are moments in the book where there's all sorts of dilemmas about how you confront McDonald's. The NAACP in Los Angeles um, initiated a selective buying campaign against McDonald's in order to protest what they saw as racially exclusionary policies where black franchise owners couldn't get stores in white neighborhoods or in the white suburbs. But they have an announcement for the boycott and they say, uh, we're doing a boycott of McDonald's, but don't boycott the black owned ones. And you know which ones those are because those are in black neighborhoods and that's why we're protesting. And it gives you kind of whiplash. And so I think it just shows the way that, you know, race constrains so many opportunities. And even people who hated fast food, like Dick Gregory, the comedian, he stood in solidarity with a black Burger King owner who felt like he was being racially discriminated against. And so I think it talks about the power of racism to um, infiltrate at all kind of economic levels. But I also want to say that overseas, yes, McDonald's is a target as a symbol of cultural imperialism, and it's really popular among middle class and upper class youth as something that's very trendy and cool in ways that we don't imagine it here. Um, I have another question about the sort of, it's a, more of a scholarly question about the history of capitalism school within yeah. history and an excessive focus on neoliberalism in particular. Now you concluded your talk with discussing both the politics of health and also the fight for 15, the politics of labor, uh, both of which have been very upended in our globalized neoliberalized economy. So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about Ra racial capitalism, racialized capitalism, how we should think about that with neoliberalism. Is it just a continuation of the politics of race and segregation and inequality from the post-war period or is it something new? You know, it's, it's, that's a great question. It's kind of, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a reiteration of the exclusion of African-Americans from the democratic process as worthy um, recipients of what the state has to offer. And so what happens is um, the state is able to present um, economic opportunity as racial justice um, by uh, doing this kind of slippery thing with representation, right? Um, so you don't wanna oppose a black owned business, right? Because there's a clear understanding of the hurdles that one has to um, jump over in order to, order to have the business. But the black owned business doesn't really answer any of the concerns that often animate the confrontation with the state. But then you're so confused as to what exactly you're encountering that you kind of lose sight of, you know, like what exactly is happening. And so I think that what happens in the late 1960s expertly is that the freedom struggle of the 
of the previous 15 years with Brown v. Board of Education with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, it puts in place um, the, the idea that all people have redress with the state because of these kind of articulations of constitutional rights. And so then it's like, well, and we're done. But the next phase, when they're saying, well, how is this gonna actually improve the quality of life? How do we do schools? How do we do housing? How do we do jobs? And you know, there's, there's this, this sense that these constitutional victories may create more demands for action. And so in its place, like a shiny ball is like, look at this business. Look how proud you can be to have something in your community. And so I think that it, um, it's a reflection of an insidious response to racial um, injustice. And it's accepted as progress because progress will always have to be envisioned in a constrained way because of racism. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a question about how do the ownerships of franchises match up against population demographics and change over time? Oh, that's a great question. So this is something that, um, so over the summer, shortly after McDonald's um, you know, claimed that Black Lives Matter, um, there was a lawsuit. Uh, more than 50 former Black franchise owners have sued, are suing McDonald's right now. And they're suing based on some of the um, issues that I talk about in my book that emerged in the 1970s, that people are being excluded from markets in which the cost of doing business is lower. And so this is an example of racial capitalism, right? This idea of risk. So African-Americans claim that they are assigned restaurants in certain neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods are higher to insure, have higher um, uh, rental costs, higher security costs, and their liabilities that are um, assumed by the franchisee. So even if a business is successful, there are these great disparities. In the filing, they say that the average black franchise owner makes $60,000 less per month than their white counterpart. Um, and so there's all of this kind of ways that um, McDonald's in the past, they don't use these types of arguments today, but in the past they say, well, don't you wanna do business in your community? Isn't that an honor? Isn't that what the struggle is all about? So you start to see the rhetoric of kind of representation and civil rights and progress confronting um, questions of equity. And so um, people, some claim that it still happens today, that there is redlining, that there's a different assignment of territories or as one of the people in the lawsuit told me in an interview, he said that there's a kind of a hazing that happens, that when African-Americans are interested in franchises, that they might be put in a very white isolated area to see if they will do it. And he claims that he was given a store in Lincoln, Nebraska, before he had the opportunity to move to the South as a kind of test of whether he was gonna make it. The last thing I'm gonna say about this, which is also very reminiscent of housing discrimination, is that there were anecdotes of African-Americans getting a McDonald's restaurant and the white counterparts who also franchise banding together to either intimidate or try to get McDonald's to move the person out of that territory. And so you start to see these, these practices um, that are reminiscent of other kind of extra legal means of exclusion. Okay, excellent. Um, we have a question from uh, Jen Van Stel who's saying on this second research topic of advertising, you could also look at pushback on flavored tobacco advertising and vaping in black communities, um, especially in the Bay Area and in Oakland. She's noting that that's been very salient and just wondering if you could say a little bit more about advertising those, those kinds of goods in different kinds of communities. Yeah, you know, it's, it, this is, uh, so one of the things I talk about in the book is that, you know, some of these ads do not age well. And, you know, by the perspective of, you know, 2021, they're incredibly racist or at least very reductive. You know, some of the ads say things like, you know, come to McDonald's, you don't have to dress up, you don't have to tip, um, you know, or, you know, this is a place that knows who you are. And you're like, oh, this is really um, awkward. But the one thing I do in defense of this advertisement is that, you know, if you think about a Black consumer in 1968, they've only had federal protections to be places for four years. And there's so much anxiety about encounter 
um, that's steeped in a history of um, racial violence, that for an, a fast food company to say, no, you can come here and you don't have to worry about unspoken rules and you don't have to worry about hostility. Fast food is very attractive because it's based on this idea of uniformity and consistency. And so much of the black experience of the marketplace is a lack of consistency and, and spontaneity um, in the worst possible sense of the word. And so um, some of the tropes of ethnic marketing that emerged in the 1960s um, continue today in terms of tying the consumption or the access to capital to being proud or uh, some type of community victory. Um, you know, the, the marketing of cigarettes and alcohol were a huge target in the 1980s. I imagine that some of the vaping ads um, are also criticized, not just for representation, but the saturation. So one of the kind of things that we know about fast food is that um, children of color are more likely to see a lot of fast food advertisement in the type of content that's developed around their interests. Um, this was more of an issue before streaming and before the different ways we consume media, but um, I, I'm sure there are other groups of people who are trying to combat um, the ways that uh, e-cigarettes and vaping um, are also marketed to communities of color. Um, we have a question from one of our postdocs, Salma Musa, who's saying, who's asking, you show that African Americans are unreasonably expected to drive their community's development through private business, where this work should really fall to more equitable public goods provisions or changes in policies. To what extent is this expectation unique to the African American community relative to, say, immigrant groups, where the U.S. also espouses a sort of workforce uh, workforce model for refugees? Um, you can unlock social mobility through getting a job without any kind of skills or training that the government will provide. Um, there are a lot of similarities. The so one key distinction I would make between, um, you know, like particularly African American communities and that expectation is that um, sometimes people say, well, you know, black communities should be able to have businesses, immigrant communities are able to do it. People come here, they know nothing about the country and they're able to open successful businesses. What it often obscures are um, ethnic networks of power and access to capital. And so some of these communities in which people say, well, there's so many businesses that are thriving, they're actually backed by private capital that operates within those communities or at the very least, like if we look at um, you know, uh, beauty supply stores and hair care stores, those are sometimes um, protected by networks of connection um, for supplies, right? So there's some of these advantages that aren't marked, but all of this is to say that, um, yes, there are these ideas of self-sufficiency that's driven by small and local businesses and with communities. And I think that sometimes that's used to make distinctions between good versus bad. Um, people of color who can who know how to participate in an economy and who don't. Um, so I think that what is often missing in those examples is 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 the problem of capital, which still exists today. Yeah. Um, so I guess as a final question, if there are any other questions, you can still send them to me in the Q and A. Um, but as a final question, you know, we've talked about how in the process of your research you realize that these opportunities for advancement were often billed as such when really they didn't create genuine advancement in these communities. What are, especially after this, the summer of 2020, but also the inevitable recession that's going to come as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic, what do you think are the pathways forward for Black America and um, capitalism? I know that's kind of a big question, but. So Joe Biden, if you are on this chat right now, if you decided to come to this webinar and you're thinking to yourself, how am I going to be the president for racial justice? I have your plan for your first hundred days. Um, this, this, is, this does not solve every problem, but here's a good start, right? Minimum guaranteed um, income, right? Basic guaranteed income, Medicare for all, free public college, free childcare, um, and um, the end of starvation wages. Those things alone can move us in a direction that all the summits and all of the real talk about um, you know, uh, racism and all the anti-racism workshops will never get us there. These are problems that are caused because of racial capitalism. So how are we going to chip away at this giant boulder? 
robust public spending, um, the ends of kind of like <clears throat> excessive means testing. And then we can really have an opportunity to see what people can do. <clears throat> I think our fundamental problem when we talk about racial inequality is we have no sense of how robust or interesting or um, capacious our society is if we continue to have these barriers to actual articulation of desire to contribute. So we do some of these things, right? Like we, we remove some of the precarity in which people at every kind of level of the financial ladder is living under, and then we see what happens. And so, yeah, like, you know, it, opening an Etsy art shop, opening a bookstore, franchising a McDonald's will not get us on the other side of this. It just will not happen that way. Do you think that there's a political coalition for that now that's either framed in terms of racial justice or just framed in terms of like what America needs broadly? Um, I think that there's some type thing. You know, I think that there's some interesting things that are happening. You know, um, you know, people like economists like um, like uh, uh, Derek White and Lisa Cook, and you know, some of these people who have been the talking heads that have been aligned with um, Biden, who were you know who are working for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren's campaign. I think that they're presenting kind of new ideas about how we get on the other side of it. I think for a very long time, the pro business framework. Um, has been so heavily, um, has, has been a large um, part of how groups like the NAACP and the Urban League, as well as the Congressional Black Caucus have operated. And I think that some of it comes out of the fact that if you look at the cohort of those early black mayors, and it's in those papers that I did a lot of research about franchising because they were very much aligned with black franchise owners, but a lot of them in order to run for office to get white votes had to be very pro-business and to suggest that, you know, I can be a mayor for everyone and I can look at the interests of the entire city. And so this kind of pro-business model was reified, I think, along a, a kind of wide spectrum of black leadership and moving away from that is really hard. But I think that some of the young progressives who are making more demands on the state are presenting a new way of thinking about, you know, how we get um, to real, real equity and real racial justice. Well, thank you so much, Marsha, for this incredible talk. Thank, thank you, you for the audience invitation. for coming today. I do wish that we were all in person. Um, I wish that every week, but one day we will be. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. Thank you again for joining us. And Marsha, we look forward to your book and to all of your future work. Thank you so much. Bye, folks. Thanks. Bye.